Also, if you ask questions, you'll be recorded, so be aware of that. Um, just so that if you want to return back to this, I'll just send it out to everybody in the class if you want to return back to it for this. So um, in terms of the, the general introduction and transitions, it doesn't need to be very complicated. Um, it's really just drawing on the reviews and also the introduction parts of each of the papers. Um, just give a two-sentence, three-sentence introduction before you jump in to particular questions um, about why protein folding is interesting and important and worth paying attention to. And, um, and then from that, you can probably just sort of move into an explanation of what amyloid is. Uh, and then for this, um, these, these, for some people, are fairly short, and that's fine. Um, if, if you have any questions about the specific comments that I left on your report, um, you can either ask now or, or wait and come talk to me afterwards. Um, but for these, you might just have like a paragraph answering A and B, um, a, sep a short paragraph answering C um, with just a little bit of a transition in terms of, you know, amyloid and amyloid beta contributes to Alzheimer's disease and there's a specific shape. Um, more generally, proteins need to always have a certain shape and chaperone proteins are involved in helping them take that initial shape and maybe also finding misfolded proteins and either correcting them or getting rid of them. Um, and then... Um, in general, how does the shape of the protein affect the way it aggregates? So, um, so more about why it's important um, and what is and what is a prion protein. And so, for all of that, you basically can just keep the answers you have and just put in a little bit of a, a sort of transition sentence, so it reads like a report. Um, like I said, the introduction is just pretty general, um, and then. In terms of um, the conclusions and comparison toward the end, that was another place. It um, doesn't have to be, uh, this is still maybe like three or four sentences, um, just saying overall, having talked about the two papers, what are the key points that you, um, that you think are important to keep track of as you're thinking about both of those papers. Um, actually, one other thing I should have mentioned as well is um, as you're reading these papers, um, you should read through the whole paper, but um, don't necessarily try to understand every single experiment. Um, and like I said in one of the optional other videos, you don't need to go into the materials and methods into detail. Uh, and, and you should use these particular questions as sort of guiding um, points for where to focus your attention when you're reading the papers. Um, so there's a little bit more to say about, especially the follow-up, but just in terms of the rest of the report, the introduction, transitions, um, and, uh, and so on, what questions do people have about all of that? No? Okay, so, um, so for the follow-up, um, most people had at least the beginning of a question, um, what you... There's a lot of different direction that you can take a follow-up, uh, and there's not any, there, there's, yeah, I mean, probably literally infinitely many follow-ups that, that uh, one could imagine. When you're thinking about this, some of this will be based on conclusions that you draw and actually, um, oh, this, <laughs> um, I guess, yeah, so, so this was a fragment sentence there, but that's okay. Um, what are the similarities and differences and just the conclusions? Um, so as the, the different reports, you might have slightly different conclusions that you focus on in that last little bit before the follow-up than other people in the class, and that's fine. Um, some of the big picture ideas about the idea that um, when proteins misfold and they have a particular seed, that uh, a misfolded protein can act as a seed, rather. And so what that means is one misfolded protein has a second bind to it, and now you've got two misfolded proteins, and then they're stuck together, and then they come and find to uh, another couple, and now you've got four misfolded proteins. And so um, all of the naturally normal shaped proteins in the cell um, of this particular type start to take on this misfolded shape, and then they often clump together. Um, and so, but then there are, you know, a lot of different ways that you can go in terms of follow-up. Um, so in, in the, the right paper, um, they talked about 
sequence diversity across multiple species um, and sort of in terms of uh, the, the evolution and the sequence um, similarities and differences. And so you could um, go from that and systematically, uh, you could imagine sort of systematically changing um, the sequences in some proteins and seeing if those proteins no longer aggregate with the others um, and what parts of those proteins are especially important for taking on that, um, that shape and causing those aggregates to form. Um, there's a somewhat similar sort of set of questions in the Jones paper. Um, one of the things that they looked at is normal human and mouse have similar secondary structures, whereas uh, this hamster has different um, secondary structures, but um, a, a couple mutations um, in one direction or the other in the hamster or the human um, form will make it take on the other secondary structure. Um, you could imagine thinking about, you know, other secondary structures that you might um, work with and how those might change as well, um, looking at a different protein. Um, sort of in general, the ideas that I have or the ideas that I usually think of when I think about um, how to do a follow-up, um, and this is not extensive or exhaustive, but just sort of my, um, the first few things that I think of um, are, first of all, what can we do that gets at a more smaller mechanistic scale? So, for example, what is it about these particular amino acids? Um, are they hydrophobic versus hydrophilic? Um, are they allowing an alpha helix to form versus not allowing an alpha helix to form or some other type of secondary structure? Um, so what is it about these particular amino acids that make the uh, changing them change the structure locally in the protein? Um, and so you could look for, um, there are a lot of different ways to address that. Um, you could mutate those into other amino acids that are in neither of these. Um, you could mutate, you could um, look for other species that have um, either similar to human and similar to hamster uh, um, and then see if that it's those same amino acids across all of these species that determine this. Um, you can look and see um, if you uh, if you mutate these amino acids into something that is in neither the human nor the hamster version, how does that affect the shape of the protein? Um, so just in terms of like narrowing in on these particular amino acids, there's um, a lot that you could do with that. Um, similarly, with these sort of immunoglobulin domains, um, if you um, uh, so here they've analyzed the sort of similarities and differences in the immunoglobulin and fibronectin domains um, across many proteins in the human genome, um, and they draw some conclusions about how that sort of um, is protective against certain types of misfolding. Um, you could extend that to other protein domains. Um, Besides immunoglobulin and, and fibronectin, um, you could also um, isolate, sort of like they did in the Jones paper, um, isolate a couple of proteins with high similarities and a couple of proteins with low similarities and actually see if when one misfolds, does it change the, the shape of the other. So sort of getting in and testing some of the sort of details of that. So that's sort of the first idea, sort of like getting into some details a little bit more, getting down to a smaller scale. Any questions about that? Yeah. Yeah. So you should have um, uh, one open question. So yeah, you're gonna. So if you have multiple, it's okay. But you're gonna be graded on whichever one is most thoroughly explained. So yeah. So what is one open question? Um, and then um, without getting into too much detail, essentially means sort of explain in three sentences, maybe four sentences what kinds of experiments you would do. So um, you need, do you need to track down other species with other domains? Do you need to track down individual proteins, put them together and see if they form aggregates? So on. Um, so, um, so it's a, yeah, but, um, but yeah, the, the, this is asking for one open question. And so if you put down more than that, then that's okay. But um, you're graded, then I'm going to just see whichever one I think you had the most detail about. I'm going to grade based on how much detail you had on that one. And did you sort of, yeah. And this is also, since even though we had the one draft, um, I would encourage you all to send me additional drafts before the final deadline 
um, of like, okay, this is the three, four sentences that I've got now that we've talked about. Now that you've sort of sat here and listened to me talk about this. Yeah. Um, the deadline is going to be on the 16th. Yeah, you have, you have uh, um, yeah, a little more than a week. I moved it back because I wanted to have time to get everybody together and talk about this and then make sure this is available for everybody. Yeah. Um, okay, and so um, another direction that you can go is to, um, rather than getting down smaller scale, is sort of take the same approach and do it and, and look at it in a different context. Um, that's a little bit more sort of, fuzzy in a sense and how you might do that um, but you could look for example um, rather than looking at uh, sequence identities in human um, you could look at sequence identities in mice if you have some particular question about like why you think mice might be different from humans or something like that um, or you could look at sequence identity in um, say, viral proteins that might actually come in contact with human proteins under some conditions if a virus infects a cell, um, and then if those, see if those viral proteins also have the same sort of patterns of, uh, of statistics in terms of the similarities and dissimilarities in terms of the sequence identity in them. Um, you could also, um, one, yeah, one thing sort of along the same lines is extend this to a, a different domains um, besides um, immunoglobulin and, and, and feral domains. Um, in terms of um, this, they were looking at um, primarily at uh, uh, um, uh, the PR protein, uh, uh, PRP23-144 uh, amyloid fibrils, um, but that's not the only type of protein that forms clumps in the reviews, there were a, a number of other proteins that they alluded to um, where that, go? They, that form different clumps. And so you could pick a different protein and do the same sort of analysis or propose to do a similar sort of analysis of the secondary structure on that protein and how that might um, be conserved or not across species. Um, so taking essentially similar methods to what was done in these papers and use and taking a different protein that might be involved in a different disease. Any questions about that? Yes, no, okay. Um, and then the last thing that I sort of think about with this is how do we sort of move this toward treatments? Um, and so with that, you could imagine, for example, if we um, have a mouse that is developing um, some, uh, some sort of... Uh, um, neuropathy, some sort of brain uh, dysfunction as a result of a lot of amyloid fibrils in it. Maybe if we engineer that, those mice to express some hamster amyloid in there, the hamster doesn't form fibrils as much or doesn't form the same type of fibrils as the mouse, as the normal mouse amyloid. And so maybe you could slow down the progression of the neurodegeneration in those mice. Um, there are some reasons why that might not work, but um, it's, it's something that would, I still think, be interesting to try and interesting for the context of this report to explore how that could potentially be used as a way to um, alter the trajectory of a disease. Um, or if you, um, you know, again, again um, often with this sort of moving into treatments, the first step is, is doing things with animals rather than people. Um, and so you could do, for example, you could say, for example, what if we um, engineer mice, we, we sort of assume that mice have similar um, uh, statistics of their sequence um, identity across um, many different proteins within, within the animal. And so we could say, well, what if we um, alter the genomes of those mice so that some of those proteins are more similar than they normally will be, um, does that make those mice more susceptible to certain diseases? Or if we make those, those, those proteins more dissimilar, does that make those mice um, less susceptible to certain degenerative diseases naturally? Um, you could also imagine um, I don't know, other ways that you could potentially convert this into treatments um, that are a little bit more uh, um, speculative, but, um, but maybe you could imagine um, find, um, developing uh, antibodies that specifically bind to these initial seeds 
of misfolded proteins that are clumping together and cover them up with an antibody so that they don't then stick to other proteins and cause um, a degenerative progressive disease to develop in the organism. Um, that's actually kind of the basis of, of some of the ther um, um, experimental uh, therapies for Alzheimer's disease that have had some mixed results, but, but that idea is actually um, is being tried. And so, um, I mean, there's a lot of other ways that you could imagine um, translating this into um, different diseases. And again, you can draw on the reviews and the multiple different diseases of misfolded proteins that they, uh, that they describe in the reviews. And from, the, from drawing on those, you can think about, well, how would I maybe manipulate this in one disease or another? Um, I guess, yeah, those are the main things that I, I mean, that's not an extensive list, but sort of those three things is how do we sort of get into the molecular mechanism at a very small scale? How could we maybe move this and talk about it and do this very similar experiment, but with a different protein or in a different disease model or in a different organism? Um, or how can we translate what we've learned into um, something that gets closer to a treatment for a particular disease um, are kind of the three most straightforward kinds of follow-ups that I usually think of. Yeah, are there questions about those or other ideas that people have that they want to discuss or ask about with everybody here? Mm -hmm. um, probably not because the seeds um, tend to be pretty specific for misfolding other proteins like themselves and the antibody is going to be a very different protein from the other one um, yeah so there are challenges in terms of getting the antibodies into the cell or whatever but but usually um, the, the this this sort of misfolding prion protein uh, mechanism um, is very specific to a certain type of protein and an antibody is going to be different from the protein that binds to it. Um, or you could think of, you know, can we use this as a way to um, have a, um, you could, you could imagine making a disease worse, which sounds like a terrible thing to do, but um, actually that's sort of the basis of if you want to understand um, what else is going wrong in a brain when um, humans have Alzheimer's disease, maybe you, try, you say, well, this is something that is clearly involved in the degeneration. Is there some way we can speed this degeneration up in a way that then allows us in the two-year lifespan of a mouse to have something that recapitulates more of the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease? that humans get in a, in a mouse, for example. Um, yeah, so what other questions do people have? That's kind of all I had in terms of stuff that I was thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, into the, into the witch, the... Yeah, for these, um, yeah, you should still have write these up in a paragraph form where the in the in the maybe two to three paragraphs of the introduction of of this, um, you will address all five of these points in there. Yeah. So in the final final report, we'll have one introduction and then maybe one. Uh, for Jones and yeah, yeah. Rights and one for the follow-up. Right, yeah, and yeah. Another one for like some comparison. Yeah, so so yeah, so you can have sort of like introduction, um, review of Jones, review of Wright. Um, you could do conclusions and follow-up together, or you could do like comparison and follow-up, something like that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, honestly, the transitions are not going to be a huge part of the grade. The bigger part is what you is is answering the questions and making sure you have sort of yeah an understanding of what goes on in the report in the papers, um, and then um, yeah the the part that people seem to have the most uncertainty about was the follow up part. Yeah. 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 Y
Um, I mean, so you should say, what, what are you going to do? So you know, so you're going to like mutate this and then you're going to look for, you know, what is the, we're going to use a similar method to what was done in Jones to look at the, um, uh, secondary structure of the protein and the different aspects of it. Um, uh, or maybe you have some better idea. Maybe you've decided that like that method is bad and you really want to, um, do x-ray crystallography because it has higher resolution and you know more about x-ray crystallography or whatever, that's fine too. Um, but it would be, yeah, it, it, it's, it's th three, four sentences, the whole thing. So, yeah, so, so it's, you don't need to go into a lot of detail about that. Um, just, you know, mutating these residues, why you're mutating these residues, what you're mutating them to, and what you expect, what, what are you going to measure, and what do you expect to see in that measurement. So, um, yeah, I mean, three or four sentences. Um, and this is something, too, that I'm very happy to um, just, you know, you can send me a draft of your one to two paragraph follow-up via email, and then I'll let you know if that looks about right or, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I don't tend to be very picky about references, um, uh, especially for, for the papers that are already provided. Um, you can just say, yeah, you can just say Jones, Wright, and, um, and, uh, the first authors on the the others, which are uh, and uh, Chiti and um, and Hart and Hartle. Um, so for those, if you're just citing these four papers, I already know which ones those are. So you can just say which of those four you you mean, and you're fine. Um, if you draw in external references, then um, MLA format is what I'm most comf more familiar with, but there's also APA and other things, and I'm kind of happy with any of them. Um, as long as it's clear, you know, um, the the author of whatever it is, um, or if it's a website, the the URL and, and um, the, the title of whatever it is, um, the date that it was published, and if it's a journal article, like what journal it was published in, um, and pages, I guess. Um, so... Um, yeah, so, so it's, um, as long as all of that information is there, then that's fine. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I'll stop the recording, but then if people want to come